You're listening to the Cycling Podcast at the Vuelta a España in association with Rafa. Today we are in Lagos de Covadonga. Well, Fran, here we are, one of the most iconic places on the Vuelta a España, can I say that? Yes, of course, you can say epic as well, because this is the kind of climb that will be described as epic. We're at the summit of Lagos de Covadonga, uh, it's pretty murky, pretty ghostly up here, the, the clouds are coming in, that's happened over the last hour or so, so you can't see an awful lot, and to find the press tent is just a, about a kilometre from the summit, and to find our way up here we really had to follow the noise, didn't we? Yeah, pretty much, I mean, there is there is a lot of fog and it's a shame because we can enjoy the marvels of the landscape that we have here which is pretty awesome or it would be pretty awesome it is absolutely beautiful it's stunning it's a really green lush place this Asturias and uh, I was commenting on that on the way here wasn't I it's beautiful all these kind of conical hills around here uh, we're also quite close to the coast as well i'm staying at the by the coast tonight so it's uh, yeah it's a beautiful place just to give a quick recap of the stage because we are obviously recording as the stage is unfolding yeah. they're on the lower slopes now of uh, the climb up to lagos de covadonga the, 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 the one rider ahead when i last checked was ivan garcia cortina the, the local rider riding more like a, like a, a souped up capri than a cortina don't know you're looking at me. Yeah, Fran, I, think, I, guess, uh, I, I am uh, not Eng- I am not English. I am not a Scottish. I am. I can't get that joke. Okay, fair enough. We'll let that one go. So early on in the stage, Mikhail Kwiatkowski, who had a, a big uh, go yesterday, was aggressive again, but he didn't get into the day's big break. Twelve riders got away after 40 kilometres, including uh, well George Bennett, who has lost time, but you know still up there. Ben King yet again. Balcomola, Matteo Gegenhart. Fabio Fellini, um, Valerio Conti, Pierre Roland, Nick Schultz, who featured in our Kilometer Zero earlier in the race, um, and then uh, Garcia Cortina, Nicholas Roach was there, Danny Van Poppel, and uh, that was a strong group that raced to uh, quite a, a decent lead, six, seven minutes they had at one point, but then Astana had been on the front for a long time. I mean, they've looked like they've been riding really hard, but the, the gap wasn't falling that quickly, so you don't know how hard they're going, but certainly a statement of intent for uh, Superman Lopez on the climb. Yeah, I mean, they, they brought a team for stages like this. I mean, there are riders like uh, Nikita Stalnov, Jan Hurt, or even Andre Seitz that are such pure climbers, have been waiting for this moment in order to shine and do their, be- their bit of job for Miguel Angel Lopez. And since he is feeling super, superman, see, he is normal that they, well, try to take advantage of their chances. So big pressure on Lopez to, to finish that off on the climb. But it's it's kind of played into Simon Yates and Mitchell and Scott's hands a little bit too because it's it's sort of given them a bit of a day off so far. Yeah, it has played in their favour, definitely. They had to control the race for the first part, but the second one, it's been entirely in the hands of Astana. Movistar, apparently, but I was told, he has taken some pulls also, but mostly it's Astana who are trying to smash the race into pieces. Well, this is the first proper long climb. Um, I was speaking to Daniel, television's Daniel Freeberg there, who said he spoke to George Bennett at the start. Bennett's kind of out of it overall, but his teammate, um, Stephen Kreuzwick, still very much in it. And he said that he watched out for him in the third week. He, he goes very well in the third week of a Grand Tour. And I think these uh, sort of conventionally long mountain climbs like we'll see later in the week in Andorra as well will really suit him uh, so will we watch what unfolds now on uh, Lagos de Covadonga exactly first great real showdown of the world between the GC contenders it's going to be fun to watch Well, Fran, they're well on the, onto the Lagos de Covadonga climb now. We've seen a, a flurry of attacks. And it was, uh, well, Miguel Angel Lopez went very early on. And I wondered if it was a, kind of the same phenomenon as uh, Rafael Maica the other day, where his team had done so much, there was a sort of pressure on him and expectation that he would, he would launch something decisive, but didn't really get anywhere. And he was brought back quite easily, mainly, it seemed, by Nauru Quintana. Yeah, I think he was mostly testing the waters, you know, and trying to get the selection made as quickly as possible and he did indeed. It was uh, Thibaut Pinot who made the best, the most out of the Superman move because he broke away 
broke clear. Uh, he has a good margin of over 15 seconds now. Well, I was standing with Daniel Freib there, and he was saying Pino will like this weather. You know, he doesn't like the extreme heat, and this is quite cool. I'm thinking Simon Yates will maybe like this weather as well. It's 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 positively chilly up here. Um, Kreuzweg and uh, Alejandro Valverde have been a little bit distanced. Pino has got away and is building a decent lead and it's it's fairly tactical behind. Are you surprised how tactical it is? I mean, we've seen Lopez attacking up a couple of times. We've seen Simon Yates have three or four goals, which I've been quite surprised about. The one guy who's not attacked yet, Nairo Quintana. Well, it's clear that uh, Nairo is taking a quite different approach to the one he had yesterday where he was uh, attacking the whole time, leading the way, only to later think uh, ba- think backwards and move backwards. So, yeah, in this case, the, 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 the initiative to the others. I was quite surprised in the one of Simon Yates' attacks, he was let leeway. You know, he got away, got a 10 seconds margin that was quite dangerous for the rest of the for the rest of the rivals and it seemed that again Quintana and Lopez looking at each other an awful lot like they fear each other more than anybody else yes I mean they know that they are the two best climbers of this World Espana and they are focusing too much on each other's moves Superman has flown again Fran is uh, Pino still out front I believe he is is Pino going to win the stage probably yes because no one is setting the steady pace it is needed in order to counter his move. But if Lopez or Nairo break away, they can. You know, who I've I mean, seen dropped and losing a lot of time is uh, Rico Berturan. Yes, Uran's gone, Kreuzweg's gone, Valverde's back. Uh, Simon Yates is getting very, very frustrated with Nairo Quintana for not helping him chase Lopez. He was throwing his arm up there. There was a joke last night that Quintana had tendonitis in his elbow last night, wasn't there, from all the elbow flicking he was doing yesterday trying to get Lopez through. But now Lopez is away and they're not really chasing behind, despite the fact that Valverde and Quintana are both in that group behind now. Yeah, and uh, it's not only Pino who has broke away. Pino has is relatively back in the GC, but Lopez is close. Yet they are not fighting to bring him back. From grand tours to group rides, the Champs Elysees to coffee shops, Rafa exists to celebrate the world's most beautiful sport. Big thank you to Rafa for supporting the cycling podcast and enabling us to be here. And a reminder that they host regular rides every day of the week for more than 20 clubhouses around the world. One ride that's coming up soon is the Rafa New York Vuelta tribute ride. That's on Sunday, September the 16th. Uh, Rafa New York will embark on a Vuelta Queen Stage tribute ride from Beacon to the Rafa Clubhouse. It's 85 miles. It travels south on the west side of the Hudson River and goes over a number of challenging climbs, finishing at the Clubhouse in New York and where the riders will enjoy a Spanish feast in the Clubhouse. That's Sunday, September the 16th. Level is advanced and details are on the website, rafa.cc. We've been reunited with Daniel Friba as we uh, come down the mountain in the car. Daniel, I come out the fog here. That was a... Uh, that was a very, very well taken win by Thibaut Pino, wasn't it? Yeah, and it was stealthy as well, Rich, because Nairo Quintana didn't know that he was up the road. So he disappeared into the mist. And Quintana, is that true? Quintana, well, Quintana told me that it was a it was a, a deserved victory for Superman Lopez. His team had worked all day, and congratulations. Wow. Uh, I mean, not not that it made much difference. I mean, Quintana sort of tailed off a little bit in the end, but. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's a reminder of what Pino is capable of, and it puts him right back up. He's only two minutes ten down overall now. Uh, it depends what version of Pino we get on the time trial on Tuesday, doesn't it? Well, and in a Vuelta of micro differences, two minutes is quite a lot. Um, but who knows? In in a week's time, they might two minutes might not look like that much the the whole thing might stretch out when we get to Andorra and some longer climbs and um, they're sort of homeopathic time differences at the moment aren't they Um, homeopathic attacks tiny doses of not very potent toxins that are being thrown (laughs) from rider to rider they are cancelling each other out a little bit and Pino you felt was 
allowed a little bit because he wasn't, you know, he is a bit further back overall. What did Pino say at the finish? Well, Richie, he talks about the weather and we thought he would. Um, he has made quite a bit in the past, so he's made quite a lot of the fact that his family, not only does he hail from the Vosges region of, sort of northeastern France, um, but his family has lived there for generations and he thinks that this is why he um, well, it's so hardwired into his DNA to like the relatively cold weather and not like the hot weather and he's, he talks about how he'd suffered a lot in the first uh, week in, at the World Tour when we were down in the south and it was very hot and um, as soon as he lost a minute and 45 seconds um, in the first week in those crosswinds um, he, he felt that he was maybe out of general classification at least for the time being and he should concentrate on the stage and he um, had immediately marked the Lagos de Covadonga stage in his diary not least because it's a you know it's a very famous climb um, iconic climb and he also thought that yeah the favourites would give him a fair amount of latitude um, if he did attack and he got 15 seconds or so that they would would mark each other um, and that's what happened he went up very quickly as well very close to the time set by Quintana two years ago and Quintana went up that climb a lot of it on, on his own uh, or you know he, he certainly atta- made his move quite near the bottom so a really a really strong performance from Pino um, and he's won stage in all three Grand Tours now as well which is impressive there aren't too many riders have done that Simon Yates what about him I mean he must be growing in confidence we'll hear from his sports director Matt White who's arrived back at the race just in time to to plot the final week and mastermind a a victory here but um, he must be feeling increasingly confident because really he was able to match anybody today and even perhaps uh, look a little bit stronger yeah, I think he'll be growing in confidence, particularly vis-à-vis uh, Naira Quintana. Um, I think with Quintana, there's always this, partly because of his whole demeanour and um, this this vibe that he gives out of kind of still waters running deep, um, that there is always a huge attack or something monumental um, in store and that he's going to launch some incredible attack and really over the last couple of years we've seen that on very few occasions but one place we had seen it was the Lagos de Covadonga two years ago where he launched really a race winning attack and um, I I think Yates might have been fearing that today and it didn't come and not only did it not come but the fact that Quintana didn't collaborate with Yates behind um, some of those attacks indicated quite clearly that Quintana didn't have the legs to do that the worry I think is Superman of course. Well, I spoke to Matt White at the finish, and he, he was talking off the tape about uh, the time trial on Tuesday, and you know Quint- the head-to-head between Quintana and and Yates. And Quintana, we we're talking about Pino and his inconsistency in time trial. He's capable of brilliant time trials, but also very poor ones. Quintana's kind of the same, and he, it's been a few years since he's put in a really strong time trial. And in fact, looking at the head-to-heads between him and Yates. Yates has the edge and certainly in the last couple of seasons he's got the edge Uh, the only time Quintana uh, really has beaten him I think was in the Vuelta two years ago which Quintana won and their circumstances at the time were very very different but anyway here is what Matt White had to say at the finish well Matt there was a feeling today particularly would be really potentially quite decisive what what do we learn I mean Simon looks the equal to anybody here yeah, I think what it's shown is the top five or six guys are very, at a very, very similar level. I think uh, today was, was a great opportunity for anyone to really force the pace and to distance the others. And what they've done is they've, they've distanced three or four guys in the back end of the top ten. But you saw that last five or six kilometres, uh, they had each other covered, I think. And very tactical. It was very tactical up there. Yeah, it was. Uh, I think anyone who had super legs could have made a difference today uh, but they were watching each other a lot of, lot of cat and mouse and yeah we uh, come away with a, a good situation in the end he must be growing significantly in confidence is he? yeah look he knows he's in good shape uh, and it, he'll take a lot from the, from what, what happened in May as well uh, he's had a pretty calm first 14 days quite different to how we rode the Giro but uh, we had different plan at the Giro and we're racing different people he's a naturally a very aggressive rider and uh, sometimes you've got to hold him back. Yeah. But the plan of the Giro was to take time when we could because we knew we were going to lose a lot of time to Dumoulin and, and Froome. Whereas we're, you know, tomorrow on, the, on the time trial here, we're racing different people. I think these guys here in the top five or six, 
we'll all be very, very similar uh, in the time trial, whereas we knew we were going to lose time. So there wasn't that same uh, importance to take time as there was in uh, in May. There's moments where he's he's got to take little and, and test the other guys. But uh, you, know, you can see we're not going out there putting it all on the line, riding for stages as we were in, in the Giro. And uh, it's time and a place. Today, though, he attacked quite early on the climb. Mm. Um, when you saw that, were you sort of, what, how, what was your reaction? Is that is that what you want him to do, just go with how he feels? Or do you want him to really sit back and wait as long as possible? Oh, I think when when you're looking at when there's only seven or eight guys left and you're alone, sometimes the best form of defence is attack, you know. Especially when you're confident in your climbing ability, uh, it's a good time to test the others, I think. And uh, we saw that, you know, eventually the cracks did appear on some of the top ten guys in GC and uh, uh, those other four or five guys were all at a similar level. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Kiss goodbye to stomach problems with the world's first truly isotonic gel. Science in Sport, go energy isotonic. Before you hit the wall, hit back. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much to Science and Sport for supporting the Cycling Podcast. You can get 25% off all your Science and Sport products at scienceandsport.com with the code CP... Fran, have you been paying attention? CP... <laughs> Fran, do you not listen to this bit? I, I, I do listen, but I forget it. I mean, it's not useful information for me because I do my own stuff. You haven't been doing much singing yet on the podcast this year. Maybe we'll get you to sing this, the code, and then you'll, you know, the, the, the website and the code. SISCP25. SISCP25. Okay. I don't pretend now that you suddenly remember it. Now, I've been rejoined by Fran. We've got rid of Daniel. We're back down the mountain. That was a pretty painful drive down the, down the mountain there. Lots of traffic. But that means there were lots of people up there watching. And it was a good, very good crowd today. We should have broadcasted the way down, you know, in order to show the reality of our work. But it's, it's been, been silence. Yeah, I mean, it's been silence. It's been boring. You know, there there is some shades in all this brilliance. Yeah, it's not great to listen to it is an, ir- an irritated silence all the way down the mountain I don't think people would have really enjoyed that anyway we heard from Matt White uh, sports director for Sam Yates of course you Fran found at the finish a gentleman who we haven't seen so far on this race but Eusebio Unzui the general manager owner main man for the last 40 years as we heard in our kilometre zero the other day behind the Movistar team yeah it was pretty interesting to speak with him because of course, today we have seen a quite strong performance by both uh, Alejandro Alverde and Nairo Quintana, yet a bit uh, disappointing, because as we saw the other GC riders attack, the only thing we've seen from Nairo, who in my opinion has the strongest legs, legs in the race, uh, has been the elbow rather than the legs. Dis- disagreement though in the car on the way down, I should have been recording this, between you and Daniel, because I think Daniel's point was that People are are disappointed constantly by Quintana that he doesn't show more aggression, that he doesn't attack, um, as if, one, he owes that to people, and two, he's capable of it. Uh, and I think we assume he's capable of it because he looks always, his expression never changes, and he doesn't, you cannot tell when he's suffering. And so he always looks like he's riding within himself, but that's not necessarily the reality. And we could see at the finish, they were all cooked. They were all at their limit up there. And so... You know, I think we can sometimes be a little bit harsh on Nairo Quintana just because we assume he's not already on the limit. Yeah, I mean, uh, above all, we, uh, the journalists are, uh, after all, we are only spectators. We have access to the protagonists to ask, to make them questions later, you know, and it's interesting to make the most obvious questions to get the answer to them. For example, when I ask uh, Eusebio about why Nairo didn't attack, we will hear it later. He responded that, He didn't attack because he couldn't. So it's basically a lack of empathy by by your part to feel disappointed and to more or less blame Nairo for a passive attitude, whereas he probably can't can't be more aggressive. Maybe we are overrating him. Perhaps. Well, let's hear from Eusebio Unzue at the finish now. 
Pues hombre, nos hubiera gustado ganar, nos hubiera, como a todos. We would have fancied a victory, like everyone. You know, the second would like to be the first. We all would like to have a better result. We've seen again how similar the level is between the five or six better GC riders. Stages go by and, far from making the situation clearer, it keeps reaffirming the uniformity. We keep kicking the ball forward. And now we shall wait for the individual time trial, where we will probably see the gaps that the mountain has haven't produced thus far. The main favourites have pretty similar characteristics and are not great time trialists. It's going to be thrilling. Why hasn't Nairo attacked? <laughs> haven't you watched the TV broadcasts? What do you think? Had he been able to attack, wouldn't he have? As I said, uniformity is the only conclusion we can take from this stage. All the favourites are within seconds. Yates, Lopez, Valverde, Quintana, Mass. Had Nairo arrived the first of the rest, we could have asked ourselves, why hasn't he attacked? But he hasn't. He would have attacked if he had been able to. Valverde is now a GC favourite in his own right. Reality says he is on a par with the best riders of this welter, so there is no reason to give that up and begin thinking about the world. He suffered a bit today, but everyone suffered. So that was Eusebio Unzue, the, the boss, the big boss at Movistar, and you know, a bit, they've got two riders up there, overall second and third, Valverde and, and Quintana, on paper, you know, very well positioned, but you don't want rider second and third. You want one rider first, and you don't really care where the other rider is. And that's that's the issue here. Are either of them capable of winning the Vuelta? I mean, we haven't spoken a lot about Valverde, but he's still there. He was dropped today, fought back on. You know, he's capable of a decent time trial and difficult difficult man to shake off. I mean, who knows what will happen in the final week? I, I don't think any of us can see him winning it, but he is still there. Yeah, and he has a very, very good shot of uh, being the, in the red jersey after the time trial. He's a very good time trial, especially compared to his rivals. So yeah, it's very interesting. At the end, he came here in theory to prepare for the Innsbruck Worlds, but he has found himself in contention and well, there is no reason to give up at this point. Another team today that was very significant was Astana and the work that they did to bring the breakaway back, make the race really hard and set up Miguel Angel Lopez, Superman, on the climb. You spoke to the director sportif at the finish, Dimitri Sedun, and I spoke to Jan Hurt, the rider. Let's hear from them both now. First Dimitri Sedun and then Jan Hurt. Is Miguel Ángel López the strongest climbers in this Vuelta? I hope, but um, it's uh, it's very difficult to to do difference because uh, Yates is very strong also. Uh, Quintana, Valverde, every time there. So um, we try, and uh, maybe <laughs> this, this third week uh, can be better for us. In the third week, will we see uh, Protino Astana? doing the same kind of race as we saw today, pulling from the peloton, trying to create gaps. I hope. So it depended um, uh, how feel the guys. Uh, so I think it was uh, for many years <coughs> our strong strong point to be present uh, the third week in the race. So I hope uh, everything go well and uh, we can we can show good uh, good race. What's going on between Nairo Quintana and uh, Miguel Ángel López? Because we see each other marking so closely. I don't think it's between uh, Nairo and Miguel. That, uh, everybody who is close in the GC now, they they look uh, one with other. Uh, I don't think uh, Miguel <coughs> had uh, something uh, with uh, Nairo. It's uh, yeah, just uh, just race. That's it. Are the favorites too close together? Is the level too similar between them? Yeah, for the moment. That was a, a lot of work you guys did on the front day, bring that break back. You must be very confident in uh, in Lopez for the, the climb up to the finish here. Yes, the team worked really well today. Uh, you guys did a really great job and we make I think we make a very hard race. Uh, last climb we really, really did a hard pace and... Yeah, Lopez finished second, I think. Yeah, it's okay. Maybe we believed also that can can make 
be a bit more seconds on on the gist rivals, but also like this is okay. We can see that he has great legs, also for next stages. So I think uh, we are going a good way. You got a very strong team, especially for these hard stages. Um, are we going to see the best of Astana? Do you think in the third week? Yeah, for sure. We hope that we we are still growing up, and next next week, last week, hard stages. For sure, we try to take jersey. And what's Superman like off the bike? Is he uh, what's he like as a as a team leader? Yeah, Miguel is really really nice person, and and we believe everybody in him because we can see he's flying in the, in the climb. So yeah, we we trust in him. So while we're on a roll with the, all the interviews, uh, Fran, you spoke to Henrik Mass, who was maybe the surprise today of all the the guys in that group, the Spanish climber on quick step. Still a very young rider, very promising, but I think he was probably the surprise today. Yeah, he was. I mean, all these days he has proven to be quite strong, but uh, it is also true that both the stage finishes to Les Prades de Nava and La Camperona suited perfectly his abilities of a light punchy rider the Lagos de Covadonga was a different kind of challenge a more a longer more steady climb yet he was up there with the vest so it was surprising but on the uh, the other hand it's reassuring because that means that a new GC guy is building up in Spanish cycling and one that is a, if at this point is able to be at the same level because Let's not forget, he's at this, he has been at the same level as Nairo, Yates, Valverde and the rest of the best. He can well develop into a future Grand Tour winner. I'm really happy because to be with these riders on the top, I think for me it's a, a dream. And yeah, uh, we go day by day. I feel better day by day so that's really nice yesterday i stopped with antibiotics today i feel a little bit better and yeah tomorrow rest day day to enjoy enjoy until madrid and if i can be top 10 in madrid it's gonna be really nice is this overcoming your expectations from before the race no i came here to also to help viviani but yeah uh, we tried the GC for the moment it's really good and we will see don't forget to listen to our morning show kilometer zero supported by the economist monday wednesday and friday mornings throughout the vuelta a españa so we heard there the reminder to listen to our morning show kilometer zero before that we heard from Enric Mass. Um, Kilometer Zero tomorrow is about the business of sponsorship and the, 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 the perennial struggle that cycling teams have to attract and retain sponsors. Uh, we'll hear from Luca Guarcellina, the Trek Segafredo boss, in that, among other people. Now, somebody who featured in Kilometer Zero in the first week was Nick Schultz, the Australian rider at Caja Rural, who's Johnny Mitchell Scott next year he was in the big break today it was a quality break he was there so was uh, Theo Gegenhart riding his first Grand Tour for Team Sky and I spoke to both of them at the finish well, let's hear first from Theo Gegenhart and then from Nick Schultz How was that today then? Um, what was the experience like of being in that in that break? Yeah it was a pretty good break actually everyone worked pretty well together I could see fairly on that we were never going to stay away because we didn't have anywhere near enough time but that was still a nice experience, nice to, to be out there and uh, yeah, have something to, to race for just being in the front. The yeah, objective of the day was to put someone in the break so achieve that. And you know some of those guys quite well I guess, guys like George Bennett? Yeah, George, Kinga, uh, Ivan who were on his home road, I've been racing with him a long time, yeah it was nice. I mean, they looked pretty committed, and it was a, a big. There was a big old chase behind with Astana, so um, they must have been. They must have been going something in the in the break. Yeah, the break worked really well together. Um, got a pretty solid pace on all day. It helped that we had um, Danny, my ex teammate, who was uh, riding for Bennett, and Fabio did a big turn on the second time up that climb for Balka. So yeah, that definitely helped a lot. But uh, in the end. I think a lot of guys forget that it's not the breakaway that decides if it's going to stay away 99% of the time it's the other way around and yeah, like I say for me it was pretty obvious quite early on that it was not going to stay away and how are you feeling two weeks into your first Grand Tour I guess this is the 
the most days you will have raced? Yeah, by far. Uh, I think the most before was uh, Swiss, uh, nine stages last year. So, yeah, rest day tomorrow is going to be really nice. Um, I improved a lot after the last rest day. Uh, yeah, maybe it was a bit to do with the heat as well, but the body just seemed to soak up the workload quite well with that, that day off. And in principle, I'd like to give the time trial a whack, but we'll see. Looking forward to the last week. Uh, family will be watching in Andorra and roads I know really well. So, Nick, um, in the break today, did you enjoy that experience? Yeah, for sure. Um, it was certainly uh, a different type of break to anything I'd been in last year. Um, a little bit more serious. There was some. Uh, I think when it when it got away, uh, everyone sort of maybe thought it could go to the line. Um, but Astana obviously had ambitions for a stage win, and uh, yeah, that was uh, when I got word that Astana were riding the front. I thought it was going to be pretty hard to go to the line, but yeah, good experience and uh, well, a good way to go into the rest day rather than fighting to uh, to make the time cut. And otherwise, how's your how's your Vuelta going? I know you. You know, your, your future team have got the red jersey here. You're watching them thinking, oh, I could be part of that next year as well. Yeah, for sure. It's um, certainly in the back of my mind when I'm uh, when I'm racing, you know, to try and go a little bit deeper into the stages because for sure next year, um, if I'm in any, any, any Grand Tour, I'm going to have to go deeper into the stages. I'm not going to be able to, to sit up when I feel like it. Um, so, yeah, that's in the back of my mind and it's really nice to see that they're doing well too. And the final week, trying maybe getting a, a break again? Yeah, I think uh, the stage after the time trial is another good opportunity. Um, also for our team, it's an important stage. It's uh, in northern Spain. There'll be a lot of supporters. Um, so for sure, really motivated to try again uh, on uh, on stage 17 or, or uh, on one of the uh, stages into Andorra. But I think uh, at that point, it's luck of the draw. So that was uh, Nick Schultz and before that, Tail Gegenhart. When I was talking about... Uh, Kilometer Zero, I should have mentioned the fantastic artwork by Annette who um, is uh, the lady who does the, the paintings for Grand Tour Art and you'll find them on social media they're selling all the uh, illustrations to raise money for the Dave Rayner Fund to support young riders and it's really lifted our Kilometer Zero series, it's uh, given them a, a really nice visual identity so we're very grateful to Grand Tour Art for uh, producing such wonderful illustrations there's one tomorrow Elia Viviani. Fran, you were going to say something there, were you? Yeah, I was wondering if we have any kind of contest ongoing where there is a Spanish favourite for the victory? Uh, well, yeah, nice, nice, nice segue, Fran. Nice, nice, yeah. Peddler de Charme poll was running today. I think it'll finish tomorrow morning, so you might still have time to vote. Um, the contenders were Ben King. Come on, Fran. Um... I can only think of Wait. my favourite. Uh, Jesus Herrada. Yeah, Jesus Herrada. Marcus Berghart and... Ivan Garcia Cortina. The local rider, yeah, who was in the break yet again today. Big, strong rider, but he's been pretty prominent in these mountain stages. And, in fact, as we heard earlier on, he was uh, leading them up the uh, Lagos de Covadonga for quite a bit before he was reeled in. Um, you spoke to him at the finish because something else he's been doing and the... The reason for his uh, nomination for Peddler de Charme is wheelies. So you spoke to him at the finish. Yeah, let's hear. How many wheelies have you done these days? I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. There's uh, <laughs> maybe four, four days. Like, I don't know. <laughs> Why do you do them? I like enjoy, but also I like the uh, people enjoy with me. I think it's nice for everybody. Also, you don't lose so much energy with this. So. But besides the wheelies, Richard the pedaling of Ivan Garcia Cortina all these days has been really charming he was telling me before the Willy question that he just felt so different when he's home in home roads that up until this weekend when we have reached Asturias he was feeling good but not all right that whenever there was a strong breakaway forming he just couldn't bridge and make it into you mean he was feeling all right but not good well, maybe I got the. I think you got that the wrong way around. But just yeah. just for clarification, so he was feeling all right, but he's yeah. been he's clearly been feeling good because it's not easy to get in these breaks, especially when you look at the other riders there. You know, it's tough. Exactly. The, being uh, but being in home roads is what 
made him step up a level and be able to deliver these performances which have been pretty spectacular for either his size for either his weight being up there in the mountains before real climbers it's pretty special pretty outstanding and if you put some wheelies in as the icing of the cake i'd say we have a pretty delicious performance which is worth a t-shirt well vote there, there's uh, Fran doing some campaigning there for Ivan Garcia Cortina and uh, good luck to him I don't think he's going to win though. I think Ben King's running away with it anyway we'll, we'll find him with a t-shirt if he does win uh, we've got we better go because we've got quite a long drive to our hotel tonight Fran rest day tomorrow we will be doing our rest day press conference tomorrow you can still phone in your questions uh, the whatsapp number you'll find that on our twitter biog so have a look at that and we have got quite a few questions thanks for them um just before we go tonight um something that i read today that i found very very moving and i recommend people to read is the interview in der spiegel with christina vogel the track sprinter who had a very nasty crash a while ago on the outdoor track at Cottbus, and uh, she's been left paralyzed from the waist down she's in a wheelchair the interview is incredible uh, i don't know if you had a chance to read it today fran did you uh, I have it open on my laptop, but I haven't had the chance to read it uh, carefully. Yeah, it's a, a very moving, harrowing, sad, inspiring uh, read, and her her spirit is the thing that shines through. She's got this very positive attitude about what's happened to her. She's obviously devastated, you know, uh, and she's adapting to a new life. But she's doing so with this incredible attitude and spirit, and uh, and it's a very very moving read. Um, but I. I recommend finding a, a, a quiet moment to read it and, you know, be prepared to be quite moved and upset by it. Um, so finishing on a bit of a, a low note, but also a bit of a high note, because, as I say, it's very moving and, and in places inspiring as well. And that's it. The Der, Der Spiegel, and there's an English translation of the article. So that's all for tonight. Uh, a rest day tomorrow. As I say, we're doing a press conference uh, podcast uh, in the afternoon, hoping to get Daniel and Lionel involved in that as well. But we'll resume with the Vuelta and the crucial time trial on Tuesday. In the meantime, thank you, Fran. Thank you, Richard.